Hey, welcome back to the channel. Just in case there's any confusion, I am not John DeVore. Just wanted to clear that up. As you probably watched in the last video, the Quicksilver project is finally completed and I'm, I'm kind of glad it's done. <laughs> it, I think it took me like eight months to finish everything. So not, not because it was such a hassle or so complicated, I just have limited time to work on these things and it's nice to have it, have it done. So uh, some of the issues were kind of learning as you go. Some of the issues were addressing um, parts availability and ordering things. And sometimes you dig into stuff and, and you just want to change things around. So anyways, it sounds great. I uh, appreciate the support and the feedback. And uh, hopefully it's helpful for somebody else who maybe gets a Quicksilver. So something that we we'll talked about that I mentioned in the last video was with the Quicksilver upgrades was that I, I we were gonna roll out a pair of Quicksilver KT80 version one mono blocks with the one with dual AR, uh, five AR4s. And we're having some, I'm, I'm, we, me, I'm having some problems with those. So one of the resistors smoked and there seems to be a problem with it. So it's gonna take some more time and maybe if it took me eight months to get through the preamp, uh, the amplifier might, might take a longer time. So. That's gonna that's gonna put off to the side, and uh, maybe I'll do a video and just put it out there and see if people have ideas. But I may have to get the insights of somebody that knows more than me on these guys. Maybe it's a bad capacitor. They're pretty old. Really nice shape though. But I was really looking forward to rolling out an old, old upgraded tube system, and it's just gonna have to wait for a while. Um, happy thoughts. Today we're gonna do something a little different. A lot of people have been asking about my vinyl setup. So I thought I would talk a little bit more in depth about that. Um, not because it's anything really spectacular. It's pretty uh, a pretty humble system, I think. Uh, it's pretty funny, you know, like some people would think, oh man, that's really crazy and out there. And then other people are thinking, you know, you know, if you're not spending dropping at least 5K, then you're just, you're just, you're not even being serious, right? So, and I'm nowhere near 5K in my analog setup. So, um, uh, the turntable that I use is a ubiquitous Pioneer PL, uh, a PLX, PLX 1000, right? And it's kind of a spin-off of one of the um, one of the uh, Audio Technica SG SJ 1200s that you see the DJ turntables. Um, so you know, it's, a, it's some people like them, some people hate them, but I I tell you, for a starter table, it's actually pretty nice. Or any of the 1200 variants, I think you could do pretty good with. So in my experience, if you're just starting out in analog, just starting out. In, in vinyl. My first table that I got, that I purchased was, uh, it was an old project, project, whatever. Uh, it was back when the company was just starting out. I, I think it was, I think it was built in the Ukraine or something like that, but it was their top of the line reference table at the time. And this was a long time ago, it was back in the 90s. And uh, I never really had very good success with it. And, and I know their current stuff is much better. But whether it was my inexperience or maybe uh, a somewhat faulty uh, application or faulty um, execution on their part, I, I'm not sure. But anyways, it was, a, it was a fully suspended table. It looked really cool. But working with a fully suspended table, you know, I was like the thing was on, it was on slinkies or pogo sticks. I mean, I could never get the thing balanced. It was always just up and down and I mean you'd walk around and you're you know it was it was a mess right so I sold that thing off and uh and I know their current and again I, their current product is, is is supposed to be pretty good from what I hear so don't let that uh, impact you in any way um probably user error okay so anyways I let that go and then some years later I purchased a second table because I still you know I had to think what is this final thing all about and I think I purchased uh, I purchased a used Conrad Johnson sonograph. It was like an SG-1 or SG-3 table. And, and a guy was selling it, the table, no arm, right? And I thought, well, that's cool. Uh, they seem to be really expensive, so I'll buy a table, which is cheap. Nobody wants to buy one without an arm. And I'll get an arm and I'll put it on it, put it together, and I'll have a, have a cool setup, right? Save some money that way. So, uh, so I, got the, I got the sonograph and I made it with a... Um, an AudioQuest PT3, which was a higher-end AudioQuest tone arm at the time. And this is back in the 90s, right? This is like a long time ago, back so long ago, like pre-internet, right? It was when it was when AudioMart was actually this little brochure that you got in the mail once a month or once every quarter, right, to look at used equipment. It was on this little paper, newspaper thing you'd get, AudioMart. Like, it was, it was like an analog version of AudioMart, right? So, um... So anyways, I got that all together and I had to make my own arm board for the sonograph, which 
I'm not sure if I got the measurements right on it, which means I probably I probably didn't. I didn't use a protractor, so they were probably wrong. But uh, but it was close, and, and it actually sounded really good. And the cartridge that I had was a uh, I think I used a, a DL a Denon DL 106. This is back when nobody nobody the only people talking about Denon DL sixes was like MJ Magazine, right? Which a good friend of mine was an avid reader of it back then. And uh, and I also purchased another another moving coil, which was a um, it was an Audio Technica OC9 Mark II, and I bought that used on like Audiogon or something like that. It was perfect, and that was a really nice cartridge. And so I had the table for a while, and uh, and it sounded pretty good. But um, this one I think is a lot more dialed in. And I think back then dealing with the suspension table and not knowing about setting up arms and having a protractor and stuff like that, um, you know, if you analog's funny, so. You know, one of the things talking about, if you're if you're thinking about diving into the whole analog LP vinyl thing, right? So, one thing I can tell you is I can tell I can tell you how to utterly fail in your analog experience, right? So you go out and buy, you know, the cheapest player you can buy, you know, like you know, fifty bucks. Get a record player for fifty bucks, then run out to Goodwill, run out to Goodwill. And, uh, and buy some records and then just come home and throw them on there. And that is the fastest way you can come out of it being very, very unsatisfied. And, and you're gonna say, what is this all about, right? Because that's exactly almost what I tried to do. So part of it is we're, we're in this, we're in this, um, you know, we're so used to very fast, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, instant gratification, right? So instant gratification, right? Which we get a lot of that with digital, right? I mean, you're streaming, push a couple buttons, it's there, and it sounds pretty good. CDs, you drop it in, push play, silver disc, it puts in. With, with analog, I mean, you know, you have to take a moment, you have to take it out of the sleeve, you have to dust off the record, you have to or clean it, you have to set it up, then you have to set up, you know, your azimuth and your VTA on, on your, turntable and I'm not trying to scare anybody off from this but I'm saying it requires a different level of intentionality with analog than it does with digital right and if you're not willing to take a deep breath count to 10 and have that little bit of intentionality with your playback system you're probably not gonna have a very good experience with analog so if you dive into this I would really you know if, if you want a budget system if you're saying hey I don't want to spend more than you know a few hundred a couple hundred bucks on a player then wait you know wait save up a little bit of extra money you know get a used Pioneer uh, get a used a really nice deck for the money nowadays is the techniques I think it's the SL is it the 1000 I'll put a link to it I think it goes for about I think you can get them for about a grand just under just under a grand and uh, that thing's just gotta be a bulletproof player, right? Very hard to mess up with that. Uh, and if you can't afford a new one, you know, wait for a used one. Just put some money aside and just wait, do it right. Uh, don't get impatient with it. You know, maybe it takes you a year to get it set up, but it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it in the end. If you're expecting to ha to be as, as, uh, as easy is not the right word, if you're expecting it to be as uninvolved as playing a CD or streaming a song, then you know, you're know you not gonna have a very satisfying analog experience. You're gonna go, what's up with this? Uh, but if you if you can be a little more intentional with it, if you can take your time on the setup and, uh, and, and or have somebody help you with it, you, know, you can have a really modest system and it's gonna be far more enjoyable than some pretty expensive digital or streaming setups. So, I mean, I use streaming. I like streaming. Streaming is cool. I use it streaming mostly for just checking out new music, you know, so if it's something I want to invest in. And if I like something, I buy the record or I buy the CD, you know. Um, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in this, you know, uh, you know, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. I like owning, owning my software, right? So, um, I think there's a benefit to that. And analog, you know, I can't explain it. It's hard to explain it. It's, uh, yeah, I know it, I know it measures worth, worse than digital. I know the signal to ratio isn't bad. I know the dynamic range isn't as good. But it sounds better. W what can I say? I mean, it's like, you ever watch those old movies on TV, right? If you're a video person. Those old movies when they were filmed. And there's this, they look different. They look different 
than modern films today, right? Modern films that are filmed in digital, they kind of have this glossy, one-dimensional look. You know, if you go to a movie, they just they just look they look just look off. But if you watch the movies that were filmed in analog film, there's just there's this warmth to them. And, and it's the same thing with the music. Mmm. That's good. Smooth mid-range. Mmm. Open top end. No, I'm not talking about the stereo. I'm talking about chromatic coffee. Yeah. <laughs> now you're saying, oh, look, the guy's schlepping coffee. No, I'm not getting paid to schlep coffee. I'm schlepping it for free. No, just a joke. I'm just sharing things that I really like. Nobody's paying me to do this. Actually, what happened is a guy named James. James uh, watched some of my videos. Everybody knows James. He, you know, he sends me an email. He says, hey, you know, sends me an IM. He says, hey, you know, I own this coffee company. You want some free samples? And I'm like, yeah, sure, send me some samples. I'm not really expecting anything, right? So James sent me some of his coffee chromatic and it's, it's really really good right i mean it's i'm in the northwest and this stuff it's really good coffee it's just good uh i wish they lived close i wish i was closer but i don't but i know good coffee when i taste it so the next question is people are going to say well why analog why should i bother you know i have high def i have high res you know and, and i know i know i know the flames are going to come with this uh Analog just sounds better. It just does. You know, well, you know, digital has a better signal to noise ratio. Well, you know, there's measurements and then there's there's what you're actually listening to. And I just, I'm finding, you know, I grew up on digital. I grew up in digital. I, I bought my first CD player, you know, what was it back in like ninth, the, you know, mid 80s when, um, you know, it was perfect sound forever. And uh, I never really had any experience with any moderate or medium or, or high-end record players. And uh, it, it, it's not about specs, it's about sound, remember? What, what you're listening to? And it, I just have way more fun. I'm, fi I'm finding now after I have this, my turntable, you know, somewhat dialed in, I'm having a lot more fun listening to records. It's, uh, it's just a more pleasurable experience, you know? I think one of the SL 1200s or some variants are really a good way to go because they're pretty much bulletproof as far as setup and they can get really good sound, right? So, you know, you're, you're not up there in the, in the megabuck tables, but you're getting, you know, maybe 80% of what's, what's out there in a cost no option, cost no, what do they call it when you're just spending a lot of money? Cost no object, that's what I'm trying to say. So. Uh, so that's that's a good deal. So we'll talk about the table a little bit. I'll show you what I did and, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you. Here she is. Here's the PLX 1000 by Pioneer. And it's funny when this goes out on the internet, I think the viewership is going to be split into two groups of people, right? So one half is going to go, oh my gosh, it's so exotic and cool, right? And then the other half of the uh, viewers who probably all, all own like, you know, $10,000 Kuzmas are going, oh my God, I can't believe the guy has to deal with that POS. So anyways, that's how it goes in audio. But anyways, um, I'll just tell you my experiences with this. And, you know, and, and I think you can get pretty decent sound out of this. I think, you know, it sounds better than my digital setup. And I've had a lot of digital stuff in the past. So when I got this, it had the uh, notorious bad bearings. And you can see the arm tube. And it was actually, it was actually this little guy up here, the one on the top. You can see dust and everything, huh? Let's go <laughs> get that off. So, and the hard thing about this is, um, you know, some people said, well, you just, you know, just stick a screwdriver in there and turn it. Well, they glued that thing down. I don't know what they glued it with, but they glued it down. And you need a special tool. You see how it's like it's split into two sides. It's like not the center pin, but the outside. You want to loosen that outside outside washer. Uh, and then you and then you adjust the bearing using that center pin with a with a small flathead screwdriver. The problem is is getting a split tip, and I'm not sure what type of tool, but I spent months trying to find the right tool for it. I couldn't find anything. So I ended up making my own tool. I ended up taking a a bit and taking a grinder and grinding it down so it would actually fit in there to adjust it. So you could loosen that lock nut and then adjust the bearing and i adjusted the bearing bearing by hand right which is a frightening thought so a little trial and error 
um, you know, and just did it, just did it barely to where it's just barely snug and, and I, no tracking problems whatsoever. So maybe I got lucky and I did it right. I know the idea of adjusting tone on bearings by hand, especially someone who's never done it before is a frightening thought, but it works. So, uh, you know, if you're willing to take your time with it and be really gentle, I, I think you could, you can end up okay. Uh, one of the things that I found really helpful with this turntable is a good mat. And the mat that I used is a, um, it's made in Germany and it's a, it's a combination rubber and cork mat and it's about four millimeters thick. Let's see if I can uh, get a better picture of that. So it's, I believe it's by a company called Pathways out of Germany, but it's a pretty thick mat. But I, I you know, I tried a lot of different mats, including the Herbie's, uh, Herbie's Incredible mat, which was just a little too soft when I used a record weight with it. But this Pathways mat, and I'll put a link in the description just to share, it, I, I, it works really good. It seems to be just the right texture for dampening this turntable, this platter, which actually has, has quite a bit of ring to it. All right, here's our platter, and I'm, I'm not sure if this will come through or not, but it's like a tuning fork. Bing! It's probably not coming through, but you really want to make sure you get this thing damped. Now, it has dampening on the on the back and on the front, there's a rubber coating on here, but it's just not enough. You want to get a good good cork rubber mat on these guys because otherwise these things, they still ring. It's about three and a half pounds, I think. So the Pathways mat, I'd really recommend for these because it seems to dampen the platter correctly and it sounds really, really great. And uh, the four mil is the one that I did. Something you have to watch out for too is that the turntable on the uh, the SL1200 variants, uh, it doesn't take the standard size mat. I'll, I'll put the information in here, but if you, it's it's grooved, the groove is inset, if you can see it. So if you buy a regular turntable mat, your records are never gonna lay flat because the turntable mat is gonna tilt up if it, if it, if it goes over that, that lip. Where if you get the right size, it'll sit just inside of the lip and it'll be flat, so you get a nice, nice flat. So you want to make sure that you get the right size mat for these. Don't you can't just buy a generic mat. It has to be one that fits the SL1200. I think it's 285 millimeter. I'll double check and I'll put it in the comment or in the in the information section here below the video. You can check that. But I think it's a 285 millimeter mat is the one that you want with these and the various 1200 variants. If you go over that, they're they're not going to fit right because there's a ridge. There's a ridge. See, you can kind of see it in this picture. Uh, that kind of shows you shows you what it looks like. So you so you want to make sure you get a mat. You just can't go oh send me a record mat. It has to be the right size. Otherwise. You know, you're you're just gonna mess yourself up. You're gonna have your warped records are gonna be even more more warped, and you're just gonna cause it's it's not gonna be a stable platform. So the right this record mat, you know, after a lot of trial and error, the this one works really well with with these tables. So something that's helpful with these tables are you've probably seen the ubiquitous record weights that are everywhere. You know, and, and I bought one of these record weights, and this is a pretty heavy one. It's about 500 grams, I think. But, um, you know, you see them everywhere, you see pictures of them, and you go, oh, that looks cool, that must be the thing to do, right? But, you know, when I started thinking about it, the main thing with a record weight is that you're adding mass to the platter, and it's already a little over a three-pound platter, and it doesn't really need mass. So the thing, the second thing a, a record weight does is it helps flatten the record and helps keep it flat. If you have a slight warp, it helps push it down against the platter, couple it to the platter, and keeps it keeps it flat. But you're, if you have a lot of weight, which this thing is pretty heavy, you know, I started thinking about that. There's a bearing, there's a thrust pad that the this pinion falls into into the into the bearing, and you're putting a lot of weight on it. So the more I started thinking about it and doing research, I think that these record clamps are really a much better deal. So this one is made by Michelle and uh, in England and I think Clear Audio makes a really nice one too. And they sell for about 50 to 80 dollars or so. I think you can get this one for about 50 or 60 bucks. But the idea is that instead of using weight to impact and flatten the record, it, it's a clamp so it actually screws, it fits down and then this little screw grabs the stem and pulls up and at the same time pushes down on the record. So you get 
the flattening of the record without the weight on the bearing. And I really recommend this style of, of record clamp with the SL1200 variant turntables. I think it's a better way to go. I think it's a, I think it's a much better way to go than a, than a weight. Um, is a clamping mechanism or a screw down one. And you know, it'll work with any, any, any center pinion. It's not threaded. It just uses this little split washer, this grommet to grab the pole piece and then, and then kind of suck it down and press down. But this really works well. I really highly recommend one of these, uh, on whatever SL12, you know, 1200 variant you have techniques, Pioneer, or any of those. It's a nice clamp and it works really well. So I hope that's helpful information as far as record, record clamps go. Uh, another idea for your table is as far as budget cartridges. So there's a lot of budget cartridges, but I really like these Nagoas. These are really nice and something you can do is uh, they make the Nagoa the 110 and this is actually a 110 body with the 200 stylus on it that features a um, Barry, um, a boron cantilever for the needle, which is really cool. Uh, so if you want to get, if you want to really a taste of a higher end cartridge, this is a nice way to go. Is you just you just buy yourself, you know, you know, set a search on eBay, look on eBay, you look for somebody who's selling a used 110 body, right? I bought this body for like 50 bucks, right? Somebody somebody had a, a 110 and you know they obviously ruined the stylus on it or it wore out and they just had a body and they didn't want to mess with it or maybe they didn't know they could replace it and they just sold it for like 50 bucks right so i bought the body and then you can get a brand new 200 which uh the 200 stylus which this is normally like a about a four or five hundred dollar cartridge we get the stylus for about 150 160 dollars and put that on your 50 dollar body and you you got a super sleeper cartridge. I mean, this is a nice way to go. I don't know of any other way to get into a boron cantilever uh, cartridge than cheaper than this. This is a way to go. A 110 body with a 200 stylus, and it fits perfect. Sounds incredible. Sounds great. Another thing I like about these cartridges is they're not sensitive to uh, input capacitance or your phono stage. So. Um, if you don't know about that, that's a whole nother thread and a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. But these are going to be really compatible with just about any phono stage that, that, that you could come up with. Um, they're not going to be that picky. So um, this is a nice way to go if you want to really taste of a high-end cartridge without spending a lot of money. So we are going to have uh, some analog upgrade videos coming up real soon too. So it's something I've been planning and thinking of for, for, for quite some time. So I acquired a... Uh, an upgraded tone arm. I required a, a, a nice Jelco, a TS-550, which was a replacement for the old, um, I think it was like a 740, which was a really nice mid-range tone arm uh, for a long time. So the 550, it's uh, it's in the same same genre, same time frame as the TS-850 with the knife bearings, except this uses the conventional bearings which i kind of prefer so anyways the plan is to get a techniques a 1200 gr and we're going to upgrade the power supply we're going to upgrade the um the tone arm and uh and we're gonna make uh like a super giant killer 1200 gr so that's that's going to come up here probably in a few months i just need to find a donor gr 1200 that i can that i can butcher so it's gonna be it's gonna be nice. I'm just kidding. You know, people. Some people have no sense of humor on these channels. You know, like I was joking about you know butchering some of the audio equipment, and people were just flying off a handle. Like uh, like you should have seen the the IM flames were coming nonstop. Like what are you doing? Oh my god! You know, I'm like calm down. You know, I'm just kidding. Nobody's butchering anything. All this stuff's try to be pretty intentional with all of it. So. Anyway, some people don't have a, a sense of humor. All right, so in close, I hope this was helpful or, or interesting, and hopefully not too horrifying. Um, um, you know, hopefully this will help you dive in. If you're thinking about going into analog for the first time, hopefully this will be helpful for you or just interesting on what I'm set up. But, uh, you know, I have to say I really enjoy it. I spend more time playing vinyl now than I do playing digital. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Okay, thanks for tuning in and, and more stuff to come. Thanks.